Aloha and welcome to Condo Insider. It is January 2017 and again I want to wish everybody a happy new year. This past year we produced about 40 plus episodes of Condo Insider with my host sitting next to me, Jane Sugimura. Good to be sitting next to you today. Yes, it is. It's very good to be here. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Well, on uh, January 18th, you know, it's the beginning of a new legislative year here in Hawaii that our legislature will meet and begin looking at a multitude of bills of which there's, I've been told, four or 5,000 bills a year get introduced and about 80 to 100 get introduced to affecting uh, condo living. And so for those who don't remember this, that the legislature has two houses, the Senate and the House. Uh, bills get introduced sometimes uh, as companion bills in both the House and the Senate. They get assigned to committees. The committees hold hearings and take testimony. And bills either move on or don't move on and eventually go to other committees and get crossed over and may become law. That's a simple explanation of a, a very lengthy process that goes from January kind of through May of 2017. So Jane, what do you think is going to happen this year in the legislature? Well, right now, um, I don't know, but we are hearing things about certain bills, certain, and certain issues that are coming up, and one of them is the priority of payment issues. And tell everybody what priority of payment is. I, I think that's a common problem. Owners don't understand that there are priority of payment policies. Right, and, and this is a, a bill that was introduced by Senator Baker. And what it does is it, it tries, it's a consumer protection uh, measure, and uh, what it tries to do, it tries to inject some kind of fairness into the payments that are due to the condominiums. Like under the, uh, uh, the condominium declaration, I mean, when, when you buy a condo, you have to pay your maintenance fees. It's a contract that you make with the association. You, you as an owner agree to pay your fair share of the common expenses. But in collecting those fees, you know, there's a process. And if you're late, there are late charges. And sometimes uh, if you break a house rule, there might be fines. And, and the problem is, is that there is a statute that says that if you're, you know, if you have these charges, there's like a pecking order, except that the associate, a lot of times the unit owners don't know about it. So if you send in, if you're a condo owner, and you're sending in your payment, and let's say you're late one month, and, and so a, a late charge, uh, you know, is applied, it's automatic, you know, 10 days, and then it, it, and it applies. But what they don't understand is that when you make your payment the next month, your maintenance fee, let's say it's 200 and you, you, and the late fee is $25. And so the very next month, when you pay your 200 it goes to the $25 late charge, and then you're delinquent. And then again. you get another late, again, and then you get another late charge. And sometimes these multiply, and some condominiums, you know, their late charges are based on the amount. So it's not like a $25 or a $30, it's like a 5%. You know, so it can escalate, and sometimes these result in foreclosure. And there's something, you know, just, you know, uh, as, as, you know, Senator Baker says, it's, you know, to it's something unfair about losing your home because you didn't make your payments on time, and it's because of late charges. And so uh, with her priority of payments, I mean, she's kind of adjusting the statute so that, you know, these things cannot be you know, the prior, she's doing away with the priority of payments. In other words, you pay your maintenance fees, and if you get a late charge, fine. That goes kind of like on the side, and you eventually have to pay it. But it's the, the primary thing is that you need to pay your maintenance fees. And there, there is a provision in the bill that says that if you don't, if you're delinquent, and, you know, you can't even go to arbitration, mediation, or file a lawsuit, unless you pay all of the fines, all of the late charges, and if there are any attorney's fees incurred because of the, you know, you're now in the collection process, you gotta pay all of that before you can even dispute it. It's pay now and, uh, and, and dispute later. And, and that portion uh, is, is being revised so that, uh, at, you know, if you have a dispute, you have to pay your maintenance fees. And then you can dispute the attorney's fees, the late charges and any fines and penalties, you can go into mediation, arbitration, or even file a small claims. 
and get that resolved without uh, you know having to pay those charges. Yeah, let me summarize that another way and see if I'm right. Uh, boards establish a priority of payment policy, and they basically say when I receive a payment from an owner, first it goes to legal fees, second to late fees, second to house rule fines. So an owner who maybe had a fine and saying I'm just going to ignore that and stick my head in the sand and avoid it, that owner doesn't realize that when they make their regular maintenance fee payment, it's first paying off legal fees, late fees, yes. if any, and then the uh, the fine. Right. So that leaves them with delinquency with the maintenance fees which will create more late fees. Right, so they're, ever, they're always delinquent. And so in essence, because they're delinquent on their maintenance fees because of how their payments were applied, they can actually be foreclosed upon and lose their home if they don't make payment. Right. And if they wanted to make payment while they fought this out, according to the current statute, they have to pay it in full before they could... They could right, uh, they have to pay in full all of the late charges that they're disputing and any legal fees that they may be disputing in order to dispute those, those charges. And, 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 and this bill says, well, that's not fair. And so what you have to do is you have to just pay your delinquent maintenance fees and not that the other charges will go away, but you can uh, initiate a mediation, arbitration, or a, a lawsuit uh, to dispute those charges and eventually you may have to pay them but you you know you're not precluded from challenging those amounts uh, because uh, under the current law you have to pay first and then dispute. Yeah so the idea behind it would be where an owner gets himself in that situation they would file for an Act 187 mediation probably. They yes. certainly could file a lawsuit but certainly Act 187 is a fairly efficient way to address that issue. Yes. And so that board would then be prohibited from any kind of collection action, such as foreclosure, until that mediation's occurred and owners had a chance to be, be heard with respect to that. Because right. you could end up with all these multiple lay fees. And, and I've actually seen experiences where owners basically had a, a parking violation. They got a $50 fine and they'd get reminders and they would then get legal letters, you owe the fine. And all of a sudden this little $50 fine plus the late fees because it's applied against the maintenance fee, they owe three or four thousand dollars. Right. And uh, I think the new bill under Baker also requires at the time this becomes that level of delinquency that the owner receive notice from the board that we have a priority payment policy, this is how your funds are going to be applied, and you have a right to mediation. Uh, to the, to, to yes, that's what this. The, the, the bill does provide for that. Yeah, and so it's a consumer protection thing, which I know the industry uh, has supported in the sense that we feel owners should have a right to it. But again, I think one of the obvious issues that comes up is it can't be used as a stalling mechanism. The mediation is going to have to be completed within a certain period of time. Right, 60 days. You, that's right, 60 days. And so you can't just file it and then never go to it and then ask for an extension and drag this out for right. years. Right. I think I think the the way the bill is written, you you f file for mediation, and it uh, you have to start within 30 days. It's got to be completed within 60. Right. So so it's it's a relatively quick process, and uh, it, it's fair to the homeowner consumer because they get a chance to challenge these. Uh, charges without having to pay the entire bill. They only have to pay their maintenance fees and it's really important you know to pay those maintenance fees because uh, what that does is that money is used to pay uh, the, uh, the expenses to maintain the common elements. So that means the common electricity, uh, it, it, for the condominium employees, uh, for you know for the uh, expenses that the, condo, uh, the association has have to operate the building. And so they have to have that money. And so, so it's fair that the, uh, the owner occupant or the owner pay those charges be, while, you know, they're disputing the... Well, to me, I, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I think the first words of wisdom we would give to an owner is when you get a letter from your board and it says you have a fine or you have a delinquency, you shouldn't ignore it. Right, you, you shouldn't you, ignore it. You should go to yeah. the board meeting, a appeal, ask for reconsideration, because what happens is owners who just keep delaying delaying for a year or two, all of a sudden these legal fees mount up when they've been given some notice as a problem uh, that they shouldn't ignore these things. They should uh, get on it, go to the board meeting, figure out what happened and try to uh, compromise. Yeah, I, I, I can't agree with you more. I mean, uh, a lot of, you know, I've, I've seen it in, in all the years I've been involved that, you know, when owners ignore these notices, 
it just makes things worse. It doesn't make it go away. It, it generates more attorney's fees, and, uh, and it, 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 it's a mess. And, and in the end, I mean, they have to pay those maintenance fees. And maybe they will get you know, some reduction on some of the penalties or the attorney's fees. But in the end, they, you know, they're going to have to pay those maintenance fees. And I think also there's a bill going to be introduced on legal fees with respect to foreclosures, correct? Yes. Uh, well, not foreclosure. This, uh, the, the, this addresses just that particular provision that says that you can initiate a complaint or a challenge uh, against the unpaid uh, maintenance fees, fines, whatever, if you're delinquent in your account. The, the, bill, uh, the, the current law says you need to pay everything, pay now and then dispute it. And the bill that uh, we, we've seen in draft form that's circulating <coughs> says that you don't have to pay the fines or the attorney's fees until, uh, until the matter's been resolved. Uh, I think the first, uh, the first draft uh, uh, on this bill was to reduce the attorney's fees, which is something you know, that uh, would be harmful to the association because you know, uh, they have to incur the attorney's fees to do the collections, and it's really not fair for them to have their attorney's fees uh, capped uh, you know, when, when they're doing the work, you know, that benefits all of the unit owners. But anyway, uh, that bill uh, basically says that you don't have to pay the, the legal fees in order to challenge the validity of the amounts that the association is claiming you owe. And I know you can't speak for everybody, but we, we all belong to these various industry organizations. Uh, and, and of course, there's always different people with different thoughts. Do you feel, for the most part, the industry supports this consumer protection uh, proposals yes. that Senator Baker and, and uh, Shimon Bakuro have come up with? Yes, I, I, I believe. I mean, I've talked to you know the condominium attorneys who are involved in these matters, and uh, and and they've they've you know basically agreed with the concept that it's it's the maintenance fees that are the important thing, and any other things like the penalties or the legal fees, we can leave them to be resolved later. Uh, and and it, it, it's important that, you know, if, if the unit owner wants to dispute them, that they have that opportunity. Yeah, my final comment before we take a short break is, is that, you know, boards don't budget for fines and late fees. When they have this issue and you have an owner now who's generated some additional fees, it's best for them to sit down and keep it a friendly place to live and find a solution and work it out than to continue this this, uh, this legal thing because for a small amount of money and the board takes a hard stand, the legal fees grow and they grow and they grow and they want to make it a friendly place for people to live and, and uh, make sure they enforce the rules and they collect their maintenance fees. But always taking a hard line isn't the best approach in my opinion. I agree. I, I totally okay. agree. Okay, we're going to take a short break and your two hosts here, Jane and Richard, will be back in a short minute. Hey, how you doing? Uh, welcome to Abachi Talk. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm your co-host. And we have a nice program here every Friday at 1 o'clock on Think Tech Studios where we talk about technology and we have a little bit of fun with it. So join us if you can. Thanks. Aloha. Aloha and Happy New Year. It's 2017. Please keep up with me on Power Up Hawaii where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and just energy future. Please join me on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Mahalo. Okay, I'm here with Brent Obergaard of the Faculty of the School of Journalism in the Department of Communications at UH Manoa. We've had a number of shows. We have a movable feast going on, and we talk about journalism, we talk about language, we talk about communication in general, and we talk about the effect of that on the country and on individual people. Brent, it's so good to, to be able to discuss this with you in our movable feast. Oh, it's my pleasure. This is a great opportunity. You'll have to come back again and again, okay? Deal? Uh, that's the deal. Brent Obergaard, <laughs> I'm Jay Fidel. We care about everything. Thanks. <laughs> Welcome back to Condo Insider. You're sitting watching Richard Emery and Jane Sugimura talk about what we expect, the hot topics for 2017 in the Hawaii legislature affecting association. Before we took the break, we talked about priority of payment and trying to balance the table with respect to homeowners who may be delinquent through fines or late fees to give them a more, more opportunity to address those issues before they end up with extensive legal fees. 
So what else do you see happening in the 2017 legislature? Well, there's talk that there's going to be this ombudsman bill. And, you know, this is the one where, you know, you've got a condo czar. And, uh, and you know, that a condo czar who is, you know, going to have oversight over disputes between owners and their boards. And, um, and I guess there's supposed to be the, a commission of, uh, of maybe six or seven people who are going to be led by this consul czar, and basically they're supposed to be addressing um, the um, disputes between the owners and the boards. What do you think of that? Well, we saw this last year, and they actually had the term condo czar in the bill. And although the, that bill was quite different, this particular bill promotes an ombudsman who would be an attorney who's hired by the state that has some oversight over the boards of directors that can actually overturn board decisions, in some cases, even remove an elected director from their position. But then that is oversight by a seven-member commission appointed by the governor. And to me, it takes away the basic principle of self-governance. You know, I, I, I don't know what your feelings are about that, but I think I do. But, yeah. uh, but you know, when you live in an association, it's like a corporation. They elect people to run the association. And we have a bunch of consumer protection laws the boards must comply with. But to have a governmental agency be responsible for overturning board decisions or judging the decisions of a board just doesn't seem right to me. No, I, you know, to me, that, that, that goes against the, 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 the core self-governance that's the linchpin of condominium governance. I mean, you live in a, it, it's like, you know, it's like uh, uh, being a citizen of a, you know, in, in a government, in a government, you vote for your elected officials. And uh, if you don't participate, you get the government that, you know, you, you know, other people voted for. And so in a condominium, you know, the owners vote for the board members. And if they're unhappy, they can unelect them. And to have a, a third party come in and actually undo or, uh, you know, take action on behalf of this board that was elected by, you know, a certain percentage of the, of the owners, I think, is, is, is just undermining all the principles of self-governance. That's in 514B. Having been in the industry a very long time, I go back and we every year hear these complaints from a very small vocal minority that the sky is falling, these boards don't know what they're doing, they're doing all these bad things. If you go back to 2004, the statute was changed to provide for a test program of the, called the condo court. Mm -hmm. We had an administrative law judge hold hearings on condo matters. Well, between 2005 and 2011, about six years, only 19 cases were filed from the 500,000 people or so that live in condominiums, not very much. And it wasn't continued. It was a test program, and the, and the, the it sunset the law. And so now we've put together a program called Act 187, a value to mediation, which doesn't cost the owner more than $175 and the board $175 to have someone like a retired judge hear their cases. And we've had quite good success with that. So I don't think we need government intervention or interference with a board's right to be an elected official and make decisions on behalf of their ownership. Right, I, and, and I totally agree. I mean, we have a, a process that works. We work very hard. Uh, I know the industry, you know, uh, there are a lot of people who work very hard to get that evaluative mediation program in place. And, uh, and from people who have participated, I've heard nothing but good things. And, and so, you know, I think uh, we need to, you know, keep those programs in place. We don't need another bureaucracy that is going to use this money that is paid for by condo owners by, I mean, every condo owner gets assessed every other year. And uh, that money gets put into the condo ed fund. And I think that that money can be put to better use rather than setting up a whole new bureaucracy uh, that's going to uh, do, do things that other people are already doing. What some people argue against evaluative mediation is even though the statute says they shall participate in mediation, oftentimes an owner or a board doesn't show up for mediation. So I know the industry is promoting some amendments to Act 187, basically putting some penalties in forth if you don't show up for mediation. 
And basically, one of the penalties I've heard uh, talked about is that a board would be stayed from taking any enforcement action if they didn't go to the mediation. What do you think of that? I think that's. I, I think that that <coughs> will be very effective because, um, uh, you know, I think the uh, the boards, you know, pride themselves on the fact that they have all this power, and the fact that they won't be able to implement, you know, uh, certain. Uh, so-called punitive actions, I think, you know, will bring them to the table. And, and I do find that it is very irritating when you have a statute that uses the mandatory word shall participate, and then they refuse. One part, one side doesn't show up. I mean, so you, we do have to add some sanctions or some teeth to that statute so that people can't disregard the law because it's in there for a reason. And if you can't bring the parties to the table because one refuses to show up, then I think we need to insert sanctions. And, and the legislators that we've talked to uh, have agreed you know, with us that, yes, they meant, when they said shall, they meant that you shall attend, you shall participate. It doesn't mean that if you, you can participate if you want to. You know, that, that's not what the statute says. It says shall, and shall means shall. That means you will. And if you don't participate, then you deserve to have, to have sanctions. And I think there's actually a Supreme Court case where, in fact, an owner wanted to do a removal election. There was an argument whether he had sufficient uh, 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 proxies or quorum to hold a special meeting to remove the board. And then meanwhile, he uh, uh, may basically, I think, agreed with that. and tried to go to mediation with the board, they didn't want to go, but the board then and went and sought legal fees and spent legal money when he, in fact, was trying to get the mediation. I think the Supreme Court denied the legal fees for the condo association. Yes, they did. Because they're saying, well, you know, you had an obligation to go to mediation, you didn't show up, and you so you want your legal fees when you could have avoided those fees by attending mediation, trying to resolve the matter first with the owner, as the statute says. So. There are risks for boards too that you know you just can't use your weight and authority and the war chest you have to treat people unfairly. Right, and I think the owners who live in these condominiums should be cognizant, you know, when 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 uh, and they should pay attention to you know what happens at their board meetings and if they find out that you know their board was asked to go into mediation and they don't appear, I mean, they should uh, uh, register their you know unhappiness with the board. And to say, well, you know, the, the statute says what it says, and it says shall. Shall means shall. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I don't know how you get around that. And so, uh, I, you know, I'm optimistic that we will get the changes in the bill, uh, you know, so that uh, we can uh, enforce it. And I think one of the other things that, we, that are going to be added to that bill is um, uh, arbitration, binding arbitration. Oh, right. and, and so how would that amendment work? Well, the current statute provides for evaluative mediation, and we use various programs of skilled mediators, including retired judges. And it comes from the Condominium Education Fund, which has about $1.8 million in it. The first hour is split between the attorney and the association. The balance paid, there's various increments in how much of that's paid. What we're suggesting in the bill is to also allow the two parties, the board and the owner, to agree to binding arbitration. And the same half the first hour would apply, but they could end the case permanently and not have to worry about what happens if they can't agree to mediation. So we want to expand it to give owners another option and boards another option to offer binding arbitration versus evaluative mediation for the same costs and effect that we uh, currently see under the statute. We're but, hopeful that'll go through. But isn't there already an arbitration statute in, this, in the condo? On, in 514B? Well, under, I can't remember the, the, the site is under uh, B, but under A, it's 121, where you can go to and, and demand arbitration. And you go through the arbitration process. But you see, you can't by statute force someone to binding arbitration. So if you go through that arbitration process under that portion of the statute, you'll get a ruling. But if you don't like it, you file what they call a trial de novo, and it goes back to the litigation phase. The only risk is if you don't succeed by 10% or more, you may be liable for the other side's legal fees and expenses to take it to the litigation side. But it's not going to be as efficient as pay $175 each side. And uh, these are more simplistic issues, in my opinion, that we, we see in the evaluative mediation. And so with the, the, the statute, 
uh, it, it means that it's, it's very expensive then to go to arbitration. So this, this alternative that you're talking about would be more cheaper and efficient if sure. you want to use it to resolve a dispute. Each side splits the first hour, which is usually around $175. The next $3,500 comes from the continuing education fund. And if the mediator feels he's making progress, needs additional funds, I believe he can get another $3,500 up to 7000 So at the end of the day, that whole thing is litigated or, or adjudicated through this mediation arbitration process at a total cost of $175 for the owner and $175 for the board. That sounds terrific. It is terrific. It's, it's like who wouldn't agree to something like that? Well, I think it's, uh, it, it's the right way to go nationally and otherwise. It's been proving that that's the right way to go to get people to the table, get them to talk about it. And what we've seen in the short time I've had to analyze all the statistics since 2004, when evaluative mediation began in 2015, and you look at all the regular facilitated mediations prior to 2015, September, they had a very low rate of success and a very high rate of refusing to mediate. When September 2015 came along and evaluative mediation came into place, there's a very high rate of success and a very low rate of people refusing to participate in mediation. That tells us that it's worth a chance to continue to improve that bill and improve that law so that we can provide methods for owners and boards to resolve their differences without government interference like an ombudsman. Right. So, so uh, given the fact that the evaluative mediation seems to be working, it really doesn't seem to be a need to have an ombudsman. No, absolutely not. I don't think that in any case you want some person who has no stake, doesn't own there, who's a government official supported by seven appointed people, have the right to overturn the decisions of an elected board of directors who own there and have an economic interest in the outcome. And, um, and, uh, and frankly, I think it's unconstitutional because it's a contract and uh, I think certainly if they're violating consumer protection or laws, that's one thing. But to interfere with the basic business judgment of the board I don't think it's constitutional, personally, you know. So anyway, believe it or not, we have like 10 more things to talk yes, about for the did. legislature, so we're going to have to have another show to go forward with this because this, as I said before we began and we were kind of prepping for this, I doubt we'll get through very much of this. There's so much going right. on. So I want to thank everybody for w watching Condo Insider. We hope you enjoy our show. We're going to do a whole new series this year. Jane, who's an excellent co-host, and I enjoy doing this most of the time anyway. Right, yeah. And Happy New Year to you all, and thanks for watching Condo Insider. I'll